Hey, hello, Ragini Got Prasad. It. <laughs> it's been it's been ages. Uh, we've just reconnected because um, remind me, you are so you are in sustainability business, right? And you you're doing coaching as well. Um, so yes, so I, um, I'm an engineer by background, so, right. you know, that's, that's what I, I got qualified in and I've worked in sustainability for, so I'm an environmental engineer, so I worked in sustainability for, you know, 25 odd years and I'm still working in that space and, um, and yeah, and I guess my, my journey's evolved and, you know, I've, um, also done a lot of personal development, personal growth, spiritual development, you know, understanding, how we work on the inside so that's kind of woven into you know uh the direction that life's taken me so um so yeah that's where I'm at great and we have met um yeah we met like something definitely almost two years ago I think it was ages ago and we had one chat and then we just kind of um reconnected on LinkedIn and the comments and stuff like that but then uh recently I've seen you being very active on the front of like ideological, like gender issues. And uh, I really love the way you, you articulated your like complex perspectives in the way that um, wasn't really, for me, it didn't seem like polarizing, that there was, there was a kind of uh, fair hearing of both sides and yet um, a really like um, re the, the true will to actually express genuine, like authentic, how you authentically how you feel about that and that we know how difficult it is with the like politically charged environment so maybe yeah let's because i also kind of you know this how i feel about um obviously i'm aligned in terms of how you articulated things and people seem to really respond well to that as well how you how you phrase things so uh maybe yeah maybe let's start like what what made you um we were talking just before before the recording you were talking about how you started um, with the regenerative systemic thinking type of uh, work, and then it, it it kind of led you into a further further dimension. So I never let you explain that. Maybe you can start with that, and and we can take it from there. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I'll probably talk to where I'm at at the moment because I think um, where what I think regeneration is. Regeneration is to me, it's regeneration of the human soul right? Um, so as we were talking before, I feel like humanity has lost its soul. And probably, you know, the last 50, 60, you know, years, it's kind of accelerated. And so uh, we've, we've kind of lost touch with the spiritual dimensions of life. And, you know, we are really fixated on what is the physical, our physical bodies, um, and manipulating and trying to change the world by changing the environment and what um i think you know what regeneration at its heart is it's it's about regenerating from within so you know understanding who we are how we think how we're connected to a greater field of life um and to me the invisible is is just as important as the visible so um so that for me is the roots of um regenerative consciousness i guess and and what i'm observing is that there are so many areas where this kind of um degenerative ways of thinking have kind of just come to the surface where we are reduced you know and we were talking about you know gender ideology where we're kind of just this body made up of parts you know you can take parts out and put other parts in and you can just and it'll be okay and um and and it's just like well that does that just doesn't sit well with me you know and I mm -hmm. think it doesn't sit well with most people because most people sense that there is something more to being a human mm. you know and um and then I've gone down the the rabbit hole of of sex and you know um what it what what does it mean to be a woman and you know deeply reflecting on my own experience you know um i'm not just my brain i'm not just my ovaries you know i'm not just my body parts there's there's something more to it you know um so so i think it's a it's a really deep conversation but um but there is that spiritual dimension, which is which is absolutely critical to you know us understanding our existence and understanding who we are. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think 
there are some things that are potentially fixed. You know, the earth is round. Uh, we've got two sexes. Uh, I don't believe that you can change sex. You know, you can certainly feel like the other sex. Um, and, you know, how we choose to express ourselves is, is completely okay. But, you know, I, I haven't seen any proof that human beings can change sex. You know, I'll, I'll try and also not remain so rigid to that thinking because maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a possibility that I don't know of because one thing I've learned about on this journey is that the more that I know, the more I realize I don't know, you know, you'd be like, you'd be like a true philosopher. <laughs> You yeah, realize yeah, absolutely. That the more you zoom, the more you zoom out to see the bigger picture, the less detail you can notice, right? Because you necessary yeah. by necessity, you have to zoom out. Yeah. Whoa, you see, like so there's so much of the map that is uncharted yet, or that's you yeah. know, I can't I, I I and if you want to really know and specialize, then you zoom in and you lose the side of the big picture. But it's something yeah. important you Sorry, said. Just give me a second, I'll just go ahead. This the light is really dodgy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. I think something critical you you pointed because you used the word soul and you used the word spiritual and you used the word and you said that there's more to our existence that the merely physical, like oh yeah. no that's that the, 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 the there's the unseen dimension of life not only the seen one and obviously we've for the past let's say 500 years we've had this paradigm where you need you need evidence that it's it's a good paradigm in many ways that you you actually have evidence you don't just float in the mythical space when things are made up and believed and there's legends and and, and gods and so on and we actually have solid science so we can verify we can get evidence and we can test things and so on and so forth right however there's there's something very important about obviously some of the it's easy to argue that some of the most existentially meaningful dimensions of human life are, are not measurable and not visible. You know, love, friendship, trust, loyalty, um, you know, passion. I don't know. Things that make us make us want to do things and keep like our purpose driven um, and have a goal and, and have a purpose as, as human beings. And like you say, um, I agree that in the very in the very least like there, there there there's a reality of sex because there's a reality of polarity that then um creates a dynamic which is generative of life so that the gener yeah. generative movement if any i mean i'm not so deep into the ecological conversations but on the purely metaphysical I'm, meta I'm a philosopher metaphysician so i understand it from this perspective and it's the, the polarity is actually which gives life, right? It gives the, yeah. the, 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 the interaction where you can actually um, reconcile things on a higher, higher order of like a dialectically, right? And then yeah. you said, you know, something's very interesting about the West. And you said uh, human beings have uh, lost, we've lost our soul and we now arrive, we're arriving at this like the end game of, of this way of thinking, which um, possibly... Uh, has been going on for for centuries or even millennia of our kind of being misled about our own nature or our own identity uh, as human beings and that i have the same kind of intuition i mean not it's not mere intuition because if we look obviously and i work with language and etymologically as well if we look at the the very birth very origins of the of the uh, Western civilization, which is we both represent. You're from Australia, I'm from, you know, living abroad, yeah. but Polish, but it's still Western. Um, the origins of what is, like before Plato, before before splitting the world into the imaginary, like the, 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 the perfect world of ideas and this, this, this uh, the world of uh, physical reality that's the, the just a, you know, um, copy of that ideal world that was the Plato but before Plato they actually the Greeks had the the um, idea of physis physis so even even Aristotle still used it in the same way and they meant by that not what we mean by um, physics like physical we use the same root but it's actually yeah. distorted meaning because the Greeks considered both the the embodied and the spiritual in fact the spiritual was embodied at that time yeah. it was you know the the ancient traditions is always like 
the spiritual is not something out there, the world beyond, some salvation, something that you have to toil on your knees before some imaginary gods to, to arrive at the afterlife and then everything's going to be okay. Like, it's actually the physics is that the, what is, is actually the, the entire spectrum of human being, including the invisible, which is what you're referring yeah. to. And then obviously, you know, Plato arrived and there was this, um, if we talk through uh, something people can relate to, which is um, Do uh, Dr. McGilchrist's um, hemisphere hypothesis, he's talking about how how the left hemisphere got lateralized and, and our thinking, even uh, through the development of vowel, which le had led to, you know, to dialectic philosophy of the Greeks and uh, as actually the disembodiment of, of these uh, certain dimensions of life and relegating them to this kind of world beyond or whatever Platonic world. And then we had the Christian theology kind of perpetuating that. And then we have science in its own way, twisting it into like, you know, the objectivity and then the subjectivity is like, it doesn't exist. Uh, because it's not uh, scientific. So, so I think there's something very deep in there in terms of how we make sense and how our perceptions of what is meaningful for human beings has been reduced to merely yeah. merely physical in this, in this newer modern sense of physical. That means not physics as the totality of existence, right? But just a certain yeah. thin sliver of reality that we can actually see. But the, re the rest of reality is infinite. But we have no yep. instruments in our techno-scientific culture to actually meaningfully talk about that. So it's being cut out of our discourse. And now when we try to, let's say, challenge those narratives, we are being attacked from the perspective of that, just seeing that, that limited strip of reality rather than having you know, non-rational, precognitive or intuitive access, perhaps, of the sense of, of something beyond that. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I, I do think science is expanding. I mean, we're we're talking quantum physics is obviously gaining, you know, traction. That you know, we're all uh, <clears throat> we're not we're not just physical matter. We're energy beings. Mm. You know, um, you you reduce an atom. You know, you look into it. It's it's predominantly energy. You know, there's there's very little matter there. So it's you know, I think it it really kind of turns the Newtonian physics and how we've really thought about reality onto its head. And, and it goes back to, well, yes, ancient civilizations, ab absolutely. I mean, they were embodying the spiritual dimensions with the physical dimensions, you know, and I, uh, I'm i quite a spiritual person. I certainly believe that, you know, we're, we're probably spiritual beings, you know, we're playing, we're coming down here for a simulation. This is, this mm. is almost a bit like a video game, you know, and, um, and yes, we've we've forgotten, but I think most of us have a sense of you know. Uh, you see, when when people are dying, they they reach for prayer. You know, um, there's there there is a connection there with you know uh, with with this kind of bigger dimension of life. And um, I personally, um, you know, yes, I'm Australian, but you know, I'm I'm an Indian as well. I was born in India. I you know very much kind of. Um, I guess early on in my life kind of shunned my Indian roots and now I'm I'm embracing it in a big way, you know, because I'm realizing mm. just the the cultural richness that's there and just this, just what we're talking about, how these spiritual dimensions were actually very much part of everyday existence, you know. There were initiations, there were festivals, there was, you know, uh prayer was incorporated into life. And it's um and so it was it was just part of who we were as human beings. And somehow along the way, we've forgotten that, you know, and, and we continue to forget this because everything I, you know, I, I do agree with, you know, Dr. McGill, Chris, the kind of reduction to that left brain thinking, you know, even children, when they go to school these days, it's, it's, it's cognitive learning, you know, yeah. um, the, yeah, the, totally. the, the, the hand and the heart have very little to do with it. You know, they, um, from a very young age, they're kind of thrown into this cognitive way of learning. And I'm, I'm forever having challenges with my, with my young son, you know, he's, he's always telling me how bored he is at school and he's, he's, he's sick of kind of rote learning. And, and it's just like, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of seeing further proof that, you know, actually we are these spiritual beings and we're, especially you look at these young kids, we, we want our spirit to be nurtured. 
you know, uh, you see people engaging in nature, you go and spend time in nature, and there's, there's something that activates your soul, you know, um, there's, it kind of clears the mind. So um, yes, you know, science, certainly recent science has probably shunned a lot of those things. But I think, I think there's certainly emerging science, you know, quantum physics that's really starting to bring this back into a, a way of thinking. So this is not just something that's woo-woo or made up. It's it's actually real. You know, you 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 see if you're the observer, you see, you know, I'm, I'm there's Robert Edward Grant and he says, you know, uh, the universe is you inverse. So the universe is a it's an absolute mirror for, you know, what we're thinking on the inside. And, you know, the the one of the sad things of our current times is we're so fixated on, you know, what we think and that's the version of reality, you know. But what I'm seeing is that what we're dealing with is just multiple perspectives. There's your perspective, there's my perspective. So uh, reality is almost like a... Um, is is bringing all those perspectives together it's not it's there's not one truth you know so so mm. i think you know the need to i guess remove attachment to our specific experience to kind of have some level of detachment to really explore well you know who is the person well who is it that's actually doing the observing here you mm. know mm. um and um these are the questions that we need to ask. And these are the questions that, you know, even with young children that we need to start exploring that, hey, we're not just these physical beings, you know, because if we're just physical beings, we may as well be a robot, you know? Well, exactly, uh, okay. exactly. That's what we fall. <laughs> we fall prey to this discourse because the discourse is yeah. informed. Obviously, I will look into the roots of language because that's where the root of thinking is too for me. Like, you know, uh, you use the word nature as well. Nature is the Latin translation of the natura, of physics, of the Greek physics. So yeah. natura is already reduced when we say natural science, we think physical science, and that's already a distortion. And then that's being amplified through hundreds of years. And now we have this, yes, so you may as well be a robot, because if that's our understanding for, for multiple generations, then people don't see. And then when you say, Again, spiritual, I think I like to be very clear, like um, like I said before, people, th th when you say spiritual, people see the kind of hippies doing yoga and getting high on drugs or something, like spiritual or, or like... Or, or, God, or, or God, a man sitting up in the sky. Or like, exactly, or man sitting on the cloud, <laughs> or like that, yeah, traditional <laughs> religious type of picture. But really, yeah. when we look into language, into the concept, sp spirit is, is, the, is the breath. So it's anything alive, it's, it's life. Yeah. So if we really advocate for life, and if we advocate for humanity, which is a form of life, and uh, nature, likewise, um, talking, you know, in animistic terms, spiritual, it's it's not to be understood. I think to make it clear, it's not to be understood through the lens of like our our monotheist legacy or Platonic yeah. Platonic kind of you know a monotheist legacy. And um, it's great that you know, yeah, obviously you're coming from from India, so that's that's what the the whole yoga. Uh, tradition is about like you 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 regulate your nervous system it's all in the body right so uh, this holistic view of the body that you can actually generate emergent properties or emergent functions within the body through how you deal with the, the physical and the psychotechnologies of yeah cognitive not only cognitive states but states of consciousness through yeah. understanding your biology understanding your nervous system understanding your physiology and so on and so forth like yeah we haven't even learned from from your culture in the west and but we already have the mechanistic science colonizing this very natural organic way of of being human and being you know uh healing our hyper response um hyper reactivity and and hijack and limbic hijacking and all of the things that our technology technological advancement kind of thrown at us without us realizing or noticing when it when it happened right yep. so so i'm i'm totally on board with you in terms of all of that um and then interestingly you said you, you you're returning to your roots and that made me think i also find paradox well and maybe um unseemingly but within this context of gender ideology i return to my roots being polish and being born in martial law, you know, I was born into a martial law. 
and yeah. uh, one of the one of the um, um, one of the babies that were you know like there was a, there was curfew and everything, and he had military and in, in in the streets, and and then yeah, I, I lived up until like the age of seven in this state, so it's still like and even I have like younger students these days, they're in the maybe 17, 19, 19, 18 years old, and they still understand even through the parents' stories, I guess, and the grandparents. Um, the the reality of communist reality, um, the communist, the ideological uh, underpinnings of weaponizing human compassion for the sake of, you know, other people's economic yeah. gains. And uh, yeah, I'm very, I feel very strong, especially with the story I told you about my students. Uh, I feel very strong about the, our having to talk about this and, and spreading awareness and in a way that is, yes, again, very um, well articulated. I think um, I can learn a lot from, from the way you, you, you talk about these things because um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just the redressing of communism, the whole gender ideology, right? It's redressing communism. It used to be proletariat. It used to be the, the inequality of the working man. And then, you know, they glorify and they, and they glorify this 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 class of people. And they create class warfare, and and that then is a justification. You know, like playing on the lowest instincts of of human beings, while at the same time, um, making it appear as if with zero effort you can be the noble citizen because you you subscribe to some kind of story that is being made the only right story about what human yeah. beings are and what human beings should be. And I think it's extremely pernicious, evil and destructive. And um, myself as an educator, I feel responsible to like, just deal with it and somehow uh, respond to it in the most, especially a person who, um, you know, advocates for communication and communication means to talk about things that are most difficult to talk about. Because if we have the majority of society just shunning away from the topics that are most polarizing um well you will end up in a dictatorship <laughs> if there's no one talking there will be a dictatorship and and there's so many good willing people who uh basically fall into the hands of the propagandist because that it's so uncomfortable it's so inconvenient to and it requires so much complexity like a complex thinking and complex work on your own language to, to be able to notice these multiple perspectives, as you rightly say, and, and presenting your own view as one of them, uh, which is not to say that they're all relative, again, it's like there, there, is, there yeah. is some truth in every one of them. It doesn't mean that they're all like ex interchangeable. That's nonsense, right? Yeah. That's the postmodernist. That's part of the, part of the destruction of discourse is the postmodern narrative. So- yeah. Yeah, I think all of that really made me um, reach out to you because uh, I think I can see that people react to it and people, well, maybe respond to it rather than react. There's, there's, you get a lot of support. People big up your 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 comments and your posts. And and um, I think that's brilliant. And I think uh, um, we are here in, a, in some sort of alliance to to bring the voice of reason to, to the discourse and show that it can be dealt with honestly and openly and without without some antagonism right involved yeah. yeah absolutely i think i think firstly it's what it takes is you know if you spend any time in kind of the personal development field you 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 learn about the ego right um and the ego is just all the conditioning that you know we've kind of absorbed over our lifetime and and suddenly that ego is in the driver's seat of our life you know, so it's it's really important to understand that, um, you know, how much power we give over to that ego, you know, and, and this is what is happening across in, in all the scenarios that you mentioned is that, you know, um, there's the victim ego, you're, you know, you're a victim, so you've got no power and you need to be rescued. So you kind of enter into this dynamic where you remain the victim you know, and um, and then you've got the the rescuer who's often discharging their own guilt, you know, and they and then you've got the perpetrator. So you kind of go around in this circle where you know um, you you maintain your victimhood because you're really attached to it, you know, and then um, the the rescuer is really attached to their identity as a rescuer, 
you know, and um, and the perpetrator is the bad guy over there. And I certainly, you know, I kind of swam in this dynamic for a while myself, you know. Uh, one of my earliest posts that I put out was, you know, and where I was kind of starting to waken up to it was, uh, uh, you know, pe the question, where do you come from, you know, um, like, for, for a long time, it's been posed as if you ask someone where they come from, that's that's a racist question, you know, uh, because you're trying to other them, you're trying to single them out. And and to be honest, for a long time growing up in Australia, I felt uncomfortable with that question because, um, but what I realised is the discomfort I was feeling was not to do with the other person asking me the question, is that I hadn't made peace with my own identity as an Indian woman you know, and so, you know, I, I was kind of caught between these two worlds, the Indian woman in, you know, in a Western world, who am I? So really caught between these two worlds. And so I felt the the question was, you know, um, an attacking one, because I just wanted to be Australian. Don't, you know, don't look at my Indianness. I just want to be Australian. And then I realized, oh, my God, like, the, the narrative was, if people ask you that question, you know, they're being racist. And I was like, Actually, most people ask you that question just out of curiosity. And to be honest, when I meet people, I want to know where they're from, you know. Um, so and then I realized that my discomfort with that question had nothing to do with the other person. It was me, myself, that I'd not accepted who I was. And and today it's like, you can ask me where I'm from. I'm I'm Indian. I came here when I was, you know, eight years old. Like it's I'm not triggered by that question anymore so what it realized was it was more to do with my perceptions you know it had nothing to do with what was was someone asking me that question and often we're in this kind of victim rescuer dynamic I'm, I'm the victim and so if someone asks me the question they shouldn't ask me the question and therefore we're kind of going into this loop of let's start controlling language you know mm -hmm. and then exactly. what, what that Again something outside the language not that's right not you sorting out your own insecurities yeah. but stop other people from taking yeah. something yeah. from you. Mm. and look i and you know i think i think there is a space for being aware of people's insecurities because you just don't want to like throw it up in their face but but at the same time to uh, have a society that's walking around on eggshells and is so fragile wow. we're we're breeding fragility you know exactly. and for me like for me when I look back at you know growing up here in 80s 90s Australia it was pretty brutal at times you know but yeah. actually it it toughened me up it made me made me who I was and I can I can stand on my own and and actually I can see that that was a gift and what happens is when you portray people as victims, you um, and I'm not saying that they need to be traumatized, but if if they're portrayed solely as victims that you need to rescue. And so people have to, you know, have this whole sort of language around you to to make you feel OK. It's you're stopping a person's personal growth. Totally. You know, and and the other thing that I realized, you know, and I always I'm a, I'm a bit of a I'm a recovering um, left wing progressive. Me you too. Know? I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and what I realized was, you know, those rescuers didn't like me having my own opinion. You know, they liked me as long as I was the victim. As soon as I stopped being the victim, they didn't like me anymore. You know? as, <laughs> yes, as, as, yes as, I know. As, you get punished. As soon as you, get, <laughs> you get punished for having power, right? Yeah, and yeah. Under the regime, regime of a compassionate regime. You, as yeah. long as you stay powerless and someone else is guilty of your own lack of work on yourself, then you're fine. Yeah. Once you, you yeah. take your power away and you don't care what people say, you become dangerous. And then yeah. that, that's the moment when you should get cancelled. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, and and here's my latest thing about, you know, we cancel culture, you know, it's social exclusion is is vicious, you know. It's a social um, death, but, effectively, but, social yeah. death. Absolutely. And but this but the kindness inclusive people are absolutely complicit in doing that. And and this is this is goes back to what you were saying in that authoritarian. As soon as you create this group of other, in this case, me, someone who's speaking my voice, who's choosing not to buy into the victim narrative, suddenly you become the other. Um, you know, it's like then it's you know, you're justified to demonize me. 
you know, okay. then you start yeah. demonizing the person. And, and I've seen you look at all authoritarian, that is the pattern. You, 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 you find this group of others, and then you start dehumanizing them in very small and subtle ways to start off with. And then before too long, you're in a really, really ugly place, mm. you know, and, and that's the same pattern that we're seeing here. And, and I think what happens is our challenges, you know, life, life is inherently challenging. We all have struggles, you know, what we're being forced to do is to reorientate ourselves to those struggles, welcome in those struggles, form a new relationship with those struggles. Um, but if, the only way that we can manage those struggles are if someone comes in and rescues you or you take drugs to forget about it. You know, this is what the kind of dehumanization or the lost lost soul of humanity looks like at the moment. Mm -hmm. But struggle is a natural part of life that is here to help us grow, you know. And, um, you know, you've had, I mean, we've spoken, you've had lots of struggles. I've had lots of struggles. It's actually evolved us as people, mm. you know? So, so how do we create a society that reori? I mean, yes, there is some really horrific trauma that happens as well. And we don't want to just kind of overlook it and say, oh, let that trauma happen because those people are developing, you know, those people. But at the same time, it's like, you don't want to encourage fragility. So there is a, there is a balance to be had here. How do we support people from, you know, preventing some of the real ugliness that happens, but at the same time, how do we allow people to move forward on their journey and grow as individuals? Right, and it's, so So again, I think exactly, we should be uh, validating perhaps people feeling, um, people who feel discriminated against, people who are being unjustly or, you know, abusive, obviously that should be addressed. And there's a whole thing about the freedom of speech going with it. But I think helping people become resilient and anti-fragile in their psychology and their relationship to themselves is not that, it's not like, again, I use, the, I, I use this phrase of, it's not a luxury. It's not like you'd rather have people feel comfortable, but like you say, struggles right now, the whole world is a bloody struggle. We're not supposed to yeah. feel comfortable. If you want to feel comfortable, you end up under an totalitarian boot. And I will not throw my students or my clients under a bus by making them, you know, telling them what they want to hear while violating the very principle of upon which human relationship is founded, where we mitigate conflict and we mitigate disagreement through speech. And if someone yeah. tries to control my speech, I will expose the fraud because that is not what you do in a in a civil society. Civil society, yeah. uh, what we're doing now, we we use we might use strong words, but we're doing it in in good faith. And um, I think some of the fraud that ideological, you know, ideologues um, are perpetuating, it has to be exposed and spoken frankly about. Um, and you're talking about this, uh, the triangle. I think it's, it's important for people to just to reiterate that we can, like, every one person is is all three of the per, of the of the toxic triangle. Per yeah, people, they right. Can, so they can move. It's a yeah. yeah, it's a circle of abuse, isn't it? So there's an illusion of yeah. us. Because obviously, I've gone through that myself as well, like yourself. That we, it's so easy to fall into this temptation of being a rescuer or being a victim yeah. or being, you know, being the perpetrator and. And it's very uncomfortable to realize when I, I remember I, I was in a relationship, an intimate relationship, and I was going to th therapy at that time. And I was cursing at that because I think that and there was more kind of initially there was predation from the other side. But I was, uh, I basically, I was weak. So, so I was projecting my discontentment about the partner to the, the therapist. And, and, and the therapist really helped me by saying, why do you give her so much power? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean? And it, it, I stayed with it. And then like, it took me a couple of months to actually, ah, oh, of course it's my responsibility. Why do I, why do I allow another person to create rage in me, create hate in me, create frustration? Like if that happens, if you feel offended easily, well, that means that's the, that's the sign 
that you should be doing some work to take your power back? Why do you want to be a, an instrument of other people's ideas, other people's you know, ideologies and, and, and mind games? Why would you want to be any kind of victim, right? You, you become a slave to some people's bullshit ideas. And I mean, I'm, I'm not saying the people who actually um, who care about you and they try to be kind to you by using the right language because that is part of it. You are trapped with those people um in a space that has been engineered from the top and that's the way of thinking like you said um you talked about playing god or like replacing parts because we can't see beyond the physical so obviously if something's wrong it's not me having to do self-work it's maybe i need to change uh, my gender or my something or my you know i should identify with something that has people there and there's and i have a mission to be uh, some sort of meaningful purpose in life because I'm part of a movement of some kind. And that's very, yeah. a real need because we've always had these things. We've had, you know, we ha we used to have religion, let's say, and then we had politics and now everything's crumbling, right? Everything's fracturing. So it's very difficult for people to find um, a genuine, let's say, tribe because we are tribal still, a tribe that yeah. has that meaningful mission and and obviously that these but th this is ultimately a religious feeling again. It's just, it's it's, a, it's something that spiritual practices of community and ritual and and ceremonies used to give us, but in a secular like techno scientific society of, of the West, it's very hard to to find the so much of everything that is very hard to uh, for something to cut through and be that authentic. And I think when when human genuine suffering, which we know that there it exists, that genuine suffering is involved, or like discrimination and um, you know the reality of people being victims. Because I think another thing is like to say that you should not feel like a victim doesn't mean that you are not a victim. There is objective, yeah. objectively, victimhood happens. It has, it has always happened. So we can yeah. be victimized by others, but it is our responsibility to not indulge in feeling like one. Right. So by indulging but we're just giving that power away so even though we are being treated as a victim you know like look at covid like um people were called all sorts of names by certainly simply asking reasonable critically important questions which now because those questions weren't uh, listened to now there's lots of tragedy and and exposure happening and and yet you know it's still part of the mind game if you if you uh, if you have like say heterodox position and someone calls you a name and you call them a sheep, well you're just falling. You, you're still within the mind game space of polarizing your opinion against someone else's opinion, and yeah, so nothing gets done. You just fight, and the the people who play the uni party that actually plays both right and left, well, brilliant. They're fighting. Yeah. We we can continue with demolishing the whole culture, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think um, <clears throat> there's there's a lot of distraction happening at the moment, you know, um, where we, we <laughs> you're seeing with the American, you know, um, elections at the moment, you know, it's like something's changing all the time. And it's just like um, you're watching these people on stage play out a game almost, you know, and and we're so dis we're so distracted, we're forgetting the power of who we are. And it's like we're giving our power away to these individuals because, um, you know, for some reason we have this delusion, oh, if that person comes into power, we'll be okay, mm. you know? Again, um, outside, but, the saviour, yeah. the saviour complex, yeah. right? Used to be yeah. Jesus, then it's going to be, I don't know, Hitler, Stalin, then it's going to be, now it's going to be one or other or another politician because, yeah. because my tribe all believe that and it's too precious for me to 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 abandon that worldview which is dysfunctional yeah. and, and maladaptive at this point yeah yeah absolutely and i think it's uh, and the way some you know I've, I've watched the way people talk about some of these people it's like oh they're this or they're that and i'm like have you actually met that person you know um your what you're dealing with is the is the projected persona of that person that you get through sound bites through media you haven't met that person you haven't spent any time with them yet we're so willing to pass judgment you know that that's how it is and yeah there's i absolutely agree we're giving our power away to the external 
but what these times and what this kind of period of, you know, I guess the loss of humanity's soul is asking us to come back within, you know, asking us to discover the uh, the power that we have within us. I think it's, is it Young that says, you know, we use 1% of our brain power or, um, you know, and, and I think, yes, we might, the reason that we use 1% is because the ni other 99% is clouded. It's clouded by conditioning, you know, oh, it's cloud. Mm. We, we've forgotten, we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten the power that we do have as, as individuals. And, um, and we've forgotten that we're actually interconnected. You know, if, if you have people in your life and if you've got challenges, you can, you can sit there and you can say, oh, it's that person. But, but my thing is, you know, and what I've noticed in relationships is that if you don't do the work, you're going to attract a similar person, you know, the pattern totally. persists. You've yeah. got, you've got and, to do and, the work. So in similar situations in life and even in non-intimate yeah. contexts, right? Oh, you, even in, with a, with a job. You know, if exactly. you don't understand the wisdom, you don't understand the uh, the spiritual evolution that's been asked for you and kind of harvest the wisdom and make, the, you know, change yourself as a person, life will keep bringing that back into your world, you know, because because we're energetic beings and it's just like, well, you're kind of attracting a certain vibration of, of people, you know, because what, and, and one of the things that I've inherently learned is that life is, life serves us you know you can we look at all you look at social media and you and people have almost become frightened of life you know mm -hmm. yeah. um and and it's just like but actually if we what what it's asking us is to reorientate find a whole new relationship with life welcome in the challenges see the people that are around you as an opportunity to grow you know, this is what all the ancient wisdom has taught us that we've chosen to forget. And yet it's like, well, I can only, I'll only be okay if this person says, refers to me in X, Y, and Z and does X, Y, and Z, you know, and, and going back to the whole um, gender thing, the, the reason that I, you know, I, I'd never even thought that I'd be talking about the reason that I came into it was when I started hearing stories from detransitioners. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes, I and, saw some. Yeah, it's, it's devastating. Yeah, right? it is absolutely devastating. And what, you know, the, the message that I hear from them is I didn't I didn't need you to validate me, validate me in um, in my thinking. What I needed it was people to listen to me and I didn't I didn't need to be rescued. You know, I needed psychological support, psychological, spiritual support. And And yet again, what we've done is this okay, you're a human body, we can, we can, we can give you um, hormones, or we can give you, we can change things, and we can fix that. And voila, you know, you can, you can suddenly be who you want to be. And I'm like, no, our identity, what creates our identity is not what's on the external, it's what's what's on the in internal, it's our thoughts, it's our beliefs, you know, and that generates behaviors and so on. But that that's what identity is. And if we want to change our identity that's what we need to change right and there's also you mentioned before i think boundaries really define our identity because obviously how can you have any identity if there's no boundaries like how can you have a yeah. country without borders how can you have a castle without walls like you know it's like boundaries yeah, yeah. but it's obviously you can twist it and say you're being such and such because you talk about boundaries but boundaries are critical like so so things are what they are simply and um yeah i think there's this there's this enlightenment myth that because only because we are pretty smart as humans and we develop technologies by means of being smart and uh, so we have science and and then we create technology that forces of capital grow out of that and then they fuel more technology and more in, in, invention and then only because we have it we're tempted to use it without actually realizing do, do we actually need it is it safe is it is it responsible and and this it drives also this um i consider a, a delusional thing a delusional view that you can buy but if you're unhappy you just you just change like say fix it even the word fix means like it's it's static 
right? Whereas life is change. Life requires adaptation. So, so you see, we are all in this container called a process of life. And we have to align with life. Life has been here much longer than we have been. Yeah. So, and we yeah. seem to be, and it's a very delusional point in history where people think uh, life itself is like redundant because life is, you know, we just reduce, uh, reduce human mind to computation, upload it to a disk, and then you can just escape this inevitably doomed planet and, and go and live in space as a, as a synthetic agent or something. And it's like, I mean, like, how far gone do you have to be along the path of completely distorted idea of, of what life and non-life is? Like, how, that's, it's, it's literally hundreds, it's, it's millennia of, 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 of wrong-headed thinking. And, you know, there's this, again, back to spiritual thinking, I think something very useful from any religious tradition is the realization that there must be something greater than ourselves simply for our life to have context that is meaningful not merely instrumentally meaningful but existentially so that we actually care about something in the most fundamental sense we must be part of something more great, greater this is what this world explains in fact any ideology but it also explains let's say commitment to another human being or commitment to a family or commitment to a lifelong project of study or anything is like there's something great i may die but maybe the work i produce will be uh like the humanity will benefit from it or i may die but my child will live on or i will die but you know whatever it is th this is a noble instinct but all of that it's it's really i believe like this is this is how i see the spiritual dimension of of being human is about it doesn't have to be a ritual and coded and coded in some dogma and whatever it's like simply again going back to ego transcending merely egotistical rationalization of things and actually working you know planting that seed of a tree under under the shade of which you will never sit i guess right is that yeah. is that yeah. ex eternalizing your own agency um, into projecting it into into the well-being of those you will never meet kind of thing so so it's something that i learned from nietzsche you know my favorite philosopher and he had that a lot in the, this kind of prophetic uh style um in like especially zarathustra and i think something like this is actually needed um of a, it, it's, it's we are asked to do that um those of us who are at the stage of actually you know facing this challenge because most of us haven't had the chance to, to you know, until very recently, to actually have to face the 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 the, the brutal reality of where we are yeah. at as a species. Yeah. But I think, yeah, transcending this little atomized sense of, you know, I'm helpless. What can I do? Um, yeah, it's it's critical, and it's not it's paradoxically once you stop caring, on a certain level, stop like embrace the risk of. Of looking, of, of feeling your mission beyond your, your limited duration of your life here and now, it actually returns to you as, as a really genuinely uh, invigorating like sense of purpose. Because you're yeah. not then, you're not also, you're becoming unchained from the, again, victimhood or, or, or a dependency on the outcome. Because yeah. you do it regardless of the outcome. And then, Paradoxically, it's like Kierkegaard's, Kierkegaard's uh, paradox of faith. Paradoxically, the most returns to you when you let go of the outcome, right? It's like it's just like the the, the dynamic of of life. It seems to be, but you can't arrive there. The problem is you can't arrive there having an in advance assessment of whether you're doing the right thing or not. You can't have. Yeah. And in at, at a proof of the return of your on your investment in advance, you have to step into the unknown and become a hero of your own story. And that is very counterintuitive to the way our culture has been built in through the, you yeah. know, the science itself always need a proof, always need assessment, always need. And we end up in hyper bureaucratizing our life, whereas the the deepest, most meaningful, you know, meaning of life is precisely in these non-quantifiable spontaneity of of being human and stepping into the unknown and being surprised and having to deal with with obstacles and, and challenges and and emerging you know on the other side 
regardless of how much suffering you it might entail, you end up kind of, you know, you end up stronger and more aware and uh, actually fit for another challenge, right? It's, uh, yep. so you actually become more resilient and more anti-fragile to, to face, because the world is not going to get any lighter. It will just become increasingly crazy and exponentially, you know, hostile in many ways. So we must be able to face the challenges with good cheer and uh, still, you know, having having um, you know um, an approach to meeting people's needs around us and and also without neglecting our own I think it's uh um yeah a lot of that yeah a lot of, a lot of talking yeah. yeah I think I think yeah what you said reminds me of the concept of Dharma and karma yeah mm. Dharma is 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 living your purpose you know and and um i've i've been spending a lot of time trying to understand what is my dharma you know and i i i realized that i've had such a simple um simple idea of of dharma a simple idea of purpose you know we we think of purpose we think of oh you know living like mother teresa or whatever but i'm realizing that it's 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 a moment to moment thing it's a moment to bringing your highest self in into each moment being your best self, recognizing how there's parts of you that are that are wounded or you know traumatized that that are still hanging on that are trying to hijack the current narratives or you know hijack attention and it's and for me my my journey of self awareness has really been about seeing those parts of myself and also recognizing my dharma in each moment you know these wow. concepts are not introduced to us i mean we've got a really simplistic idea of karma you know you you do something bad something bad happens and you know i think i i think that is it you know in, in a nutshell but there's also it's not um it's actually bringing hyper awareness and consciousness to that in each. Am I am I living my karma, which is allowing putting the ego in the driver's seat, or am I living my dharma, which is you know um, not allowing those things that have happened in my life to um, bring me down, but to actually see that they're um, moments of growth, they're opportunities for growth. How can I grow that, and how can I bring that growth and wisdom into the world? It's like we've, we've been through thousands of years where all this ancient wisdom has been lost. And I think we're at a turning point right now where actually, um, you know, I, I'm having lots more conversations with people who are, you know, utilizing their, um, their or converting or transmuting their trauma into bringing wisdom back into the world. You know, we need to move back, move away from the intellect and move into a wisdom consciousness. You know, this is what is seeking to be birthed right now. And that is from each of us living our dharma. But the moment that we put the focus outside of ourselves and, you know, draw our approval from the other, draw our validation from the other, where uh, we're almost feeding a, a, a karmic paradigm because it's it becomes insatiable, you know? Yeah, um, exactly, insatiable. Yeah. Just like the concept yeah. of nature is insatiable. It's never enough yeah. of consolation, it's right? The no. rage, the 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 indignant, the 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 um the moral indignation, the fake performative performative, yeah. you know, like the 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 mo the mode of doing it, it's uh, it's insatiable. And um, sorry, I just realized um, I was gonna speak to also. You said two things. So the first one is, yeah, we are hyper intellectualized. Uh, but then also what we see is like the, the new age narrative, which completely neglects or almost completely neglects the the intellectual, the critical, and it becomes all woo-woo and, and wishy-washy. And I think the challenge now will be, because clearly there will be this, this emergence uh, of the spiritual thinking or, you know, second religiousness, Spengler called it, but we cannot, we, while we have to move away from uh, hyper-rationalization, we have to be able to retain that, that level of criticality yeah. and critical rationality while comp complementing it with, with, uh, with the right brain, you know, embracing uh, the, the embodied sense of the sacred and uh, the, the artistic, the aesthetic um, yeah. ritual and, and all of that. Um, 
and it's clearly happening because I know that's there's some friends of mine, you know, who who are into the creative industries and they're doing great. Like people need that stuff now, and it's very yeah. clear. So, so, but then you also mentioned the keyword for me, which is conditioning, and um, yeah. obviously conditioning of behavior becomes autom automated. That's like uh, so we're being trapped in uh, um, in involuntary responses rather than rather than uh, no involuntary. Um, yeah, rather um, than authentic, yeah. Rather than responding, we react, right? It's like it's it's a yeah. knee reaction to to whatever, um, like through language in the totalitarian regimes. You know, it's it's it's, it's classic. Like like political yeah. correctness is one of these examples where you say one thing, you say trans, you say uh, transphobic, or you say whatever the the keyword happens to be, and people just completely shuts down that that language. The, the communicative function of language completely shut down and people just just spew this vitriol and it's a yeah. it's a really fascinating from the from the let's say spiritual point of view it is like a possession it's like the possessed individual um who is unaware because precisely because they don't believe perhaps in anything like the atheistic person is most vulnerable to it because they become the the the, the container of that energy um yeah but so yeah. i think also it's worth just reiterating that while in the previous ages these conditioning mechanisms or technological um um apparatus of of, of conditioning was much more primitive right and even like press or, or radio or even television and um, it didn't feed on data it it, it was just one way kind of so people yeah. can watch television and and become brainwashed in that way but these days actually it's super customized you know there's this residual data from our online offline activity purchases the voice and all sorts of warm data uh, in in yeah. our patients terms is being collected right and then that is being then weaponized and to condition us in such a more sophisticated way that it's 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 in it's imperceptible you can't notice yeah. it that's why it's not even called while we had the fifth generation of warfare was psychological warfare back with you know let's say a couple of decades ago still and now it's still obviously present with traditional technologies but now with the algorithmic and ai and everything there's the the cognitive so it's 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 on the level in it's not accessible to your conscious awareness and i think that's why it's so hard to to yeah. to build bridges i guess um yeah. with someone who has not studied these things as some of us and yet they are super certain about their point of view and and they will not it'll be yeah it will be so much harder for that person to notice that they are being used they are being instrumentalized and not yeah. that th this is their real thinking it's not their thinking it's 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 yeah. a, it's a product of the in, like social engineering right yeah but here's here's the thing that i've come to right that social engineering is never going to be more powerful than universal energy you know life Life has always got a way, you know, whether it's a cancer diagnosis, a divorce, bankruptcy, whatever, to to really bring you down to your knees, to wake you up, you know. Yeah. Um, and and I and I say to people, my job, you know, my job isn't to try and convince those who are really entrenched in their views, but there's lots of people out there sitting on the fence who um, who sense that things are off. You know, um, that's where I was a few years ago. So I'm serving those people. You know, I'm not here to try and convince everyone who's who's really entrenched, you know, uh, because it's again, if by doing that, I I ignore the fact that they're a sovereign being and I have no control over them. And then I reinforce the message that they have to think a certain way for me to be OK. Right. right, and that's, so, that in itself is narcissistic, isn't it? That yes, is that's right. Yeah. I want to change them. They are wrong. I am right. So it's still that that's part right. of us still in, a, in 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 our need to proselytize or convert people. Right. That's yeah, not yeah, the problem. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and so I think it's it's really important that we um, you know, we live our truth, you know, and 
you you attract people you you know you see people and you go oh they're people that I want to work with because there's something about their message that resonates so it's almost this mechanism within nature that by 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 diffusion you you create change so you know I'm I, I spend a lot of time thinking about change, the anatomy of change. And I think the worst thing that we can do is try to change people who are really entrenched in how they're thinking because they need to go through their journey. You know, I if you tried to change my mind 10 years ago about something, I would have I would have not been open to it. You know, there, there's a timing part of it. And I also think that these times are an initiation. You know, Hopefully. we have to have... Yeah. We have to have deviated so far from our humanity and there is an inherent mechanism in us that only allows us to deviate so far. And then and then the cancer diagnosis happens there, you know, and, and there were signs along the way. You weren't feeling well, you were feeling depressed. These are all signs. These are all signs that we're not honouring uh, who we are. But what happens is as a society, we've been told to, you know, medicate those signs, mask those signs, you know, but if we had a whole new relationship to those signs, then we would potentially not get to the cancer diagnosis. You know, so, so this is, so this is what uh, change is about. Like, I think I, I, you know, LinkedIn actually is the only platform that I use because I, you know, even my nervous system has got its limits. <laughs> I can't, I can't do X or any of those. And um, I'm not here to try and change everyone's minds. I'm here to, to share a perspective and I'll try and do it in as non-divisive way as I can. I will also draw some really firm boundaries about what I think is acceptable and not. And you either resonate or you don't. Mm. You know, yeah, I, and and yeah, yeah. That's that's what I've noticed about you, the way you articulate things, and I think that's it, it, yeah, that having the complexity, but having very clear boundaries and and uh, coherent coherent delivery of that yeah. uh, th throughout consistently, and yeah. and, and, and the yeah, other thing I, is, I, I'm, sorry, yeah, sorry, I was just going to say the other thing is I also try to not be so rigid in my thinking you know mm -hmm. this is the way and this is the right way because I'm I'm learning all the time and as I said to you the more I learn the more I realize I don't know and mm -hmm. and I think uh, and I think as human beings we don't know how this works um uh, you know we're starting to sense that this is a this is a simulation that we're living in you know mm -hmm. um and we're here to rediscover our humanity um but we need to try and do that as gracefully as possible and try not to create as much karma along the way. I, I love the ideas of karma and dharma because I also believe in the afterlife and I believe in uh, other lives and I believe that, you know, we, we, you know, what we haven't processed in this one, we live out in the next one. Um, but but to me, I also think shit. I don't want to. I don't want to keep. I don't want to keep going in the cycle of karma as well. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, in the hamster wheel, exactly. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, in in terms of my own metaphysics, um, obviously this is a belief. This is not knowledge. I will not profess that. But from all of those, you know, afterlife scenarios, I think um, reincarnation is the most plausible. I think for me. Or, or it's either that or it's just uh it's just a loop but i think it's gonna be like more like a spiral than a loop um obviously it's 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 just uh yeah a default idea but um yeah what was i gonna say refer to something you said oh yes the the this kind of dark night of the soul and we find ourselves as 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 a humanity the collective you know species as we are um that's what i was thinking a couple of days ago as well in terms of you know the the um like secret societies and and um like mystery schools they always have they always had the initiation ordeals where you where you yeah. when you when you are you're supposed to f at least feel like you're dying and then you get reborn and that's the that's the whole mystical you know you you should go through the terror of it to actually break down the the your perceptual lenses and 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 your 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 relationship to yourself and, and the world and yeah so so see in the in back in the day it used to be um 
I mean, you can do it in, 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 in peaceful times like that. You go and you become like initiated through like uh, artificially as it were. But now everyone has a chance of having their own. Like we are going yeah. through a, a super charged crisis on multiple levels. And how do you want to harness that? Do you want to harness it or do you want to escape? Do you want to run away from it? Right? Do you want to actually... Um, you know, rediscover your humanity, who, who the person that you are, and what like what's fundamentally important for you, and what 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 makes your life meaningful. Or do you want to escape indefinitely until you crawl into a metaverse pod and and you know yeah. you, you just you just live like a like a like an elf in in this virtual reality. Like, what do you like? It will not happen just without doing anything without taking a stand no. without without assuming your agency in the face of even the most you know what seems most impossible we have to believe in the impossible in a way but if enough people yeah. believes in it if enough people believe it becomes possible we never have these networks we've never had we never oh. like what are we doing now? You're you're across the planet, like six thousand miles or something. I'm here in Malta, and we're just having a chat as if you were in this room. So, yeah, you know, like people really overlook the the benefits that we have as oh, as, as humanity right now. So, so I think I agree with you. There's an inherent code of life that will assert itself against this uh, catalyst, which I call the. This this techno technocratic decay or tech, you know this 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 um this synthetic synthetic simulation that is being uh, kind of colonizing our our lived uh, experience, um it's a necessary stage like it's a necessary prompt for for yeah. life to reassert itself and be forced to counter that because life has always That's been right. right? And yeah. technology, yeah, for it, it has its own kind of nature, its own dynamic. And it's essentially the way I see it, it's incompatible, like the it's incompatible with it with the linear prog progress and evolution of life because it's 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 on a different curve. It's a it's a different species effectively, right? The technological yeah. consciousness. So yeah. but yet at the same time, we are a technological species. So that's why I think it's so difficult for us because we've always made tools, only that at the end, at, at the at the now where we are at the end of the story or at the end of this kind of uh, maybe phase of our story, uh, we've realized that the tools we've created overpower our biological capacity to, 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 to use them in a way that is um, wise and reasonable. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's... Um, and that you know, and then just to kind of wrap it up, it's um, then it feeds when when we lose that track of where to draw the boundary between, let like, let's say, of course we want to. This is amazing. We can I use my computer and I'm having a chat with you, perfect. But do I want to spend five times as much on my computer? No. Why? I don't need it. Like I'd rather yeah. spend that instead of working for it. I'd rather go and enjoy the sunshine. Right. So like, where's yeah. the boundary? Where is your, again, it, do I, do I, is my ego big enough to want a, a badass car, which I will just, you know, like, well, just drive around and whatever, like, or do I actually want to challenge that energy um, or challenge, like channel this energy into, let's say, creative work or, or meeting with friends or, right? So it's, it's this kind of, what do we need technology for? And, and when do we actually, uh, this should read the signs telling us we should be working on ourselves because technology can also mutilate our bodies under a guise of uh, equality or, you know, fairness or protecting the weak or whatever it may be. And every age has its own iteration. And I think it's, it's yeah, I'm glad we had this conversation about how, yeah, but ultimately it's, it's it, 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 for me, it, it goes back to the, the idea of eugenics and, and the eugenics movement and, and, and it's never on the table in terms of conversation about the gender ideology. And I think it should be. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm happy if you want to wrap up and kind of drive it home, feel free to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think um, we were talking about conditioning before and yes, conditioning is on steroids, you know, because we've got social media, but yeah. also, like you said, our ability to connect um, is 
is also on steroids. You know, um, I wouldn't have met you if it wasn't for this, you know, if it wasn't for the technology. But what it actually, again, it's that what it's that initiation into more of our humanness when we're more touch and connect with, you know, I guess, connected with our soul. We know when it's serving us and when it's not serving us. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah, we have the discernment that is not merely rational. That there's that's the gut, right. yeah. we call it gut feeling, right? We so the yeah. intuitive, intuitive understanding. Not to say that intu intuitive understanding is enough. We need the rational one too. But that's the thing. Yeah. Like you need you need the heart and the mind in on one team to actually have the best chance, best 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 chance of of making sense of things. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think it, it comes back to how we make sense of the world right? It comes back to science. If if our making sense of the world is just a cognitive mechanism, then then we're broken. So what we we use, our, our bodies are sense-making machines, you know, uh, a pain in our body is, is a sign. And, you know, um, nature is speaking to us, life is speaking to us. So what to really embrace or evolve into what we are asking to be evolved into it's to actually start harvesting all those signs recognizing those signs it requires a certain amount of stillness and it's this balancing of this yang and yin you know we, we're in we're all living such yang lives and it's like we need to bring that yin into our lives mm -hmm. to really discern you know develop that level of discernment you know which is the feminine in fact it's good you mentioned yes. the yin because yeah the west is very young it's in the very nature yeah. of the west the domination conquest you know wresting the nature secrets out of it through all sophisticated you know demanding the answers from nature by yeah. uh, you know certain uh, um, certain uh, methodologies and so on and you know it's great it's great you mentioned this because the yin dynamic the the, the open receptivity to experience it's actually it's actually right hemispheric and it's um and it's what uh, yeah. amisha ja she called it like you know it's uh she's a neuroscientist from the university of miami she works with army about the um uh, in the u.s army um meditation uh, training which is like military training these days you know it's not hippie training yeah. military training because because yeah. of the all the cognitive warfare going on yeah so look, so so this this very hyper uh, detailed, focused, masculine, um, young energy is has been very strong, and and we kind of lopsided to that side. But the young yeah. is is really uh, struggling, right, to find voice. Mm -hmm. And look, in medieval age, in, in the medieval times when they burned witches, you know that was also that that the attack, the war on femininity. Effectively, yeah. these old, these old, these old corrupt men, who happen to uh, you know, like that, they they hijack the sacred symbols um, into that pathological political game, and and selling it as 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 sacred, and yeah. murdering um, women. So there are some like in the you know in France, there's like there's lots of witch hands. Like there are some villages you could hardly find any woman because they were all all burned. And look, and now it's the same, just the same, same team, same team yeah. of deluded, you know, uh, hijacked human beings who now, consciously or not, want to destroy women and erase womanhood. It started with erasing manhood for the sake of feminism. Uh, and there's a lot of goodwill, obviously, in those movements. But now we see that the, the feminist rhetoric, like uh, ideology, is metastasized into this gender ideology and now it destroys the woman where where men compete in in olympic games with women and all of that and it's just very yeah. difficult to like reach out to people uh who've had this fixed idea of fighting for equality and suddenly equality becomes a severe inequality right it's it's yeah. It's, yeah. it's completely inverted itself imperceptibly so now it becomes the opposite of what it's supposed to be and and therefore we have these conversations, right? But it's ultimately it's about the femininity. I believe, as a man and as a white heterosexual man, I truly believe that without the genuine, like it's the future belongs to women. Like we we have fucked up. We had too many wars. We, I mean, the masculinity doesn't have to be toxic. Can be healthy, but still, we are. I think that testosterone makes us 
more combative than we can afford in the future. And we have to be able to, you must have a mother, um, a mother to, to be able to be feminine. And yeah, I had a conversation with a student of mine, in fact, and that made me think, that made me think about how this technological way of thinking actually deceives us in the way that we can notice it. So I was saying, I was having this argument very politely that, you know, we know that you can have, uh, yes, yeah, some women are, cannot have babies because of all, yeah, all sorts of civilizational crises we're in and pollution and so on. And, and then you, yeah, there are technological ways of doing it. So why not? Of course you can. Um, and then I said, I said, but is it really the same thing? Uh, fine, let everyone do whatever they like. But if you carry, that's why I think maybe men, we, we cannot love in the same way. Only a mother can love truly unconditionally because if you carry that life in your own body for nine months and then you go through the birthing process, you become attached on a such intimate level that it's simply inaccessible to either a man or anyone who doesn't go through that process, which who, who simply pays for that to be done by someone else. So it's, the process is decontextualized, right? And we know that decontextualization creates all these exponential curves. And according to like Gregory Bateson, he noticed that I think with dolphins, no, exactly, but that was... Um... So basically it's like, if you equate with paying for something, uh, you, you equate paying for a new life with actually breeding that new life in a, in a similar way, analogically, like let's say creating a piece of text, spending a, a two hours of your life, that's my little experience, I can create a post or I can, I can just use GPT and objectively speaking, it will produce some meaningful, meaningful text. But but I've just deprived myself of having a relation of developing a relationship to my own writing and to my own thinking through my writing. So I, I, from my understanding will be, a, it, it will translate. I don't know if you agree as a mother, but um, wouldn't it translate to you develop relationship with your child through actually being there and, and going through the inconvenience and, and the pain and everything that's associated with the process of pregnancy and, and birthing. Would that yeah, be, look, I, I, me, yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> one of my biggest wake up calls was was motherhood. You know, I realized that pre motherhood, I lived a very yang life. You know, motherhood forced me to come into my yin, you know, and that has been a really powerful thing because one of the challenges in the world is that we we associate power with the yang and we think the yin is weak. But what I'm realizing is that the yin is strong, but actually what we need, the world is naturally built on the balance of the two. You know, when you said about uh, what you said before about uh, men, you know, and, and the wars that have happened and, and fucked up, I think we need to walk together. You know, toxic masculinity happens in the absence of the healthy feminine, right. you know, or yeah. it happens in the presence of the toxic feminine because the feminine can be just as toxic as well. So mm -hmm. what we need is to is to restore that balance. And there and this is the other thing that I'm observing is that there are so many ways that we have um, we value the masculine, you know, uh, even feminism, the whole feminist movement is is framed around career success. Mm. You know, uh, motherhood, motherhood has been relegated to a lesser status. You know, you look at all the corporate fem feminists on LinkedIn, they're talking about paid paid leave or paid care, um, you know, can we get um, in for institutional daycare, you know? Um, and I can't tell you, like I, I was listening, I, I was reading something about institutional daycare and I remember leaving my child, you know, uh, nine months after I, I had my child, I we had to go back to work, I had to go back to work and the, the pain, the screaming, he was screaming, you know, um, and... And then and, and the people in the, in the daycare centre were like, oh, it's okay, you know, he's we'll take care of him. But what he just wanted to do was to be with his mother. You know, you see in Africa, the child is attached to the mother for the first 12 months, 18 months, like literally on their body all the time, right? And 
this this is how nature has made us and again we're kind of devaluing what it is to be a mother because it's more important to have a career right you because know? look because career is actually masculinizing women right it's actually absolutely like yeah. like like it's this combative like stereotypical feminist let's say is the combative very masculine energy like yeah we will yeah. fight for rights it's not to say that you shouldn't fight for rights everyone should be equal and so on and yeah of course yeah. but it's essentially it's it's an alien energy like yeah. women are powerful simply by not being that it's natural yeah. for men to be like that yeah. but for women it's the power of women is to be a feminine really yeah yeah, right? absolutely. And I was reading something the other power. day. It's a different quality of power. But what's been yeah. done, it's 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 been sold to emasculating women and effeminating men. It's complete. It's created this depolarization and de and and it has made our relate heterosexual relationships near impossible. Like, how do you even like date these days? I don't know. It's like it's yeah. been so distorted. So mangled the whole the whole dynamic right because of that yeah. what's been normalized yeah, yeah. And i i agree i think you know what we're trying to um we're trying to change men you know you men need empathy training and whatever but what i've realized is testosterone does something specific to your body it gives you hyper focus is one of the things whereas estrogen um, to a woman's body gives her diffuse focus diffuse attention you know, um, mm -hmm. that's why women can think of and, and be doing five things at once. But men need to be focused. Your your made nature made you a certain way. Nature made us a certain way. You know, there there is a reason for that. You know, uh, we don't all you you don't need to be like me. I don't need to be like you because you serve a purpose. I serve a purpose. And this is this is what we've got to realize is that y there are differences between you know, you as a man and me as a woman, we, we're so uncomfortable talking about it because if we talk about differences, somehow we're, you know, creating stereotypes and, you know, um, and I just think, no, but there are inherent differences. I mean, I, I watch, you know, we've got three boys at home. They're, they're naturally more physical, you know, they, they naturally want to play with guns and swords and whatever else. And you, and I'm not saying there's some girls who don't want to do that, but generally speaking, the way they engage, the way they interact is is visibly different. You know, that's not that's not just social. We always put it down to social conditioning. That's not social conditioning because, you know, I as a parent was really conscious not to pass on conditioning to my child. Yet, you know, one of the first words he told me was car. He'd be car, 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 you know, or wants to wants to have physical play, wants to wrestle, wants to play with guns. That's just what they do. You yeah. Know? Um and mm -hmm. and so and I and it's like we don't need to make it wrong. It's just they're more physically expressive, you know. We're more um I guess way women express this is completely different. And what we need is is valuing the power in both of those and valuing the co-creative energy that comes with both of them playing together, not trying to change men to be more like women and not trying, you know, women being more like men because the feminist movement has, you know, and, and I'm going down this rabbit hole right now, told women that you need to be like men to succeed. But uh, but what I've realised in my own body and I'm observing it because you see there's a whole lot of women experiencing burnout, we were never designed to work like men. Mm. You know, and I, I just have to say this one thing. So I was listening to this thing about, um, you know, um, in India, how um, traditionally the woman, when she has her period, you know, uh, she takes three or four days off, you know, because that's the time for rest. That's the, you know, that's the time that she cares for herself and everyone, everyone in the family does everything and cares for her, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and in this Western way of being, we just work through it, you know, and there is a physical cost to that, physical, mm. emotional, spiritual cost to that. And you civilization uh, at the end of it, ultimately. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And the the yeah. fabric of society collapses because because you're forcing. Yeah. And um, I really like, again, observing the, the, the intrinsic needs of, yeah, each human being, each individual and each sex also. Yeah. And, but I would just add to it, I agree with you that 
um, there are intrinsic differences and and they are healthy. Like I see, even though I'm quite artistically minded, you know, like I'm a right, I write poetry. Like I'm my feminine aspect is I believe well developed, right? Like that's. Yeah. But at the same time, when I'm in a trauma response, I am hyper. <laughs> I am pretty masculine in terms of like stating things and like this is it right it's like that yeah and i think i think to be able to acknowledge both sides in each individual while understanding like i think in one of the com one of the polls we we agreed with each other that everyone will have a, 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 their own temperament so some yeah. people will be naturally some men will be naturally slightly more feminine some women will be naturally more like tomboy type it's like yeah. fine just be but don't make an ideology out of it don't make a yeah. bloody philosophy like it's 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 your individual thing it's not you falling yeah. into some tribe where one thing is right and the other one is discrimination and just don't get fooled by these manipulations and and yeah but this is know. but this is the thing what they're forming they're forming an identity around it right they're, they're mm -hmm. saying this is my identity but we all know identities change over our lifetimes you know when what a dark night of the soul is it's a shedding of identities mm. right when you have a dark night of the soul you're shedding an identity and you're you're emerging into a new identity so if you've done as, wasted, as, if you're done wasted right if you actually yeah. sit with it and and shed the right. skin and you reconstitute your your self understanding but that's yeah. very uncomfortable and if someone rushes in and gives you the pills and and puts you on you know the to surgery before you even can think for yourself how are you ever yeah. gonna emerge as a human being you will can yeah. you will that, adapt as a transhuman being yeah and but that's the thing it's to when we get so attached to our identities you know yeah um, fix, so fixated, fixated fix, on, you know this this is my identity i'm i'm non-binary I'm like, I'm sure you felt non-binary at certain times in your life. I felt non-binary at certain times. It's it's that, it's that, you know, we and even in a woman's cycle, there's parts of her cycle where she feels more yang. There's parts of her cycle where she feels more yin, you know? Um, so the balance is is always, you know, in motion. You know, it's not fixed. And mm. it's like what what life is when we reorientate ourselves to life, we attune to the, you know, attune to the dance in us. What is it that I need at this time? Might be different what I need in two weeks' time, you know? Um, and and women's and women's cycles are different to men's so we have monthly cycles and then we go through menopause, you know, that they're they're really profound cycles. I bet. I you bet. Know? Yeah. It's, it's not so, nothing, right? It's being made into no, nothing. It's not, but I think it's, and yeah. so there's there's real cruelty about it. And there's there's a real covert cruelty about the whole conditioning again, conditioning our use of language by pushing it inch by inch towards, you know, merging humans with machines. So yeah, you need yeah. to have transgender in order for people to later accept transhuman. Now we see yeah. transhuman. Five years ago, transhuman would be a conspiracy theory. Now it's on the table. People are discussing it. Yeah. So we know these techniques. You know, these are these are old old techniques of of yeah. herding the population towards accepting the unacceptable. And yeah. and people really are I think I think so desperate. I just saw an article this morning, like some substagger right, and someone is like a um a Republican, I think, uh, author, and he, he says like uh, there was a how to tackle transhumanism to save our nation so then now the people want to they're so attached to the to the ideology in this case like statism they, they want state is the most important so the humanity is secondary i mean for me it's the opposite so that it's an inevitable conflict there like the, the different yeah. people will will have different identities and different value systems emerging as most fundamental and that will there will be a continuous conflict around those topics but I mean, it's also important for us, I believe, to to define it for ourselves. What is the most important? And in the wake of COVID era, I was actually, um, I had to sit down and think about it. So 
So what is it? Am I in, first to realize that you're in service of something rather than just self-serving? Because self-serving, you just end up destroying yourself because you just you just manipulate reality and it, it backfires. But you, assuming you are in service of something, what am I in service of? And I looked at back back at my life, and I've been in service of 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 humanity. Really, that's what I like both theoretically and and physically and work as educating people and you know helping people thrive is like that's what I really enjoy doing. Like I I and I'm good at it. It's like I am in service of humanity. So now I will not accept like someone like me will not accept transhumanity. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, you need you need a baseline beneath which you will not um, compromise, I think, uh, for yeah, everyone. Yeah. And even if it's incorrect, you can change it later, but you need something for which you will be able to uh, die, I guess. You will yeah. be able to sacrifice everything for it so that your your agency is meaningful so that yeah. you can yeah so that, so that you mean business like if you believe something uh, is sacred then act like it don't get manipulated yeah. by people coming with ideologies and redressing the same old tired nonsense with with new you know weapons of compassion to uh, to, yeah. to to make to fool you yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, you know, we've talked about sex is absolutely sacred, you know, with with this trans, you know, push towards transhumanism, you've got people who talk about, you know, um, chest feeding, or, you know, uh, erasing all these terms associated with womanhood, you know, yeah. people, who, people, people who menstruate. Yeah, like, birthing that, parents. Yeah, it's it's a butchery, absolute nonsense. It's a, it's a butchery of language. Yeah, and and as a as you're you're talking about boundaries as a woman, that is my boundary. You know, I will not accept that uh, normalization of that kind of language Absolutely. because and, and and what it does is it further erodes the sacredness of what it is to be a woman. You know, um, you see all other species. You know, or from from what i've seen or even you know in ancient time everything was orientated around the reproductive capacity yeah and here in modern times it's become an inconvenience you know people choose oh i'm not going to have children because it's um uh because it's resource intensive you know or um you know and i just think but actually this having children is a way of evolving the world you pass on a whole new way of being to them yes it's it also opens the door for more manipulation and all that kind of stuff but there's there's something beautiful and sacred about it and again if we remove that you know um mm -hmm. and we and we make it about you know uh birthing people or whatever they call it you know it's just it's it's so nonsensical you know so yes we we need to stand up about you know what we will accept and what we won't accept you know if we can't if we don't find the courage to talk about it um you know uh frankel's you know man's search for meaning is some every time i feel scared um i i always go back to that to me it's like if if you can find happiness and if you can draw comfort from who you are in the most dire of circumstances you know, um, it's like I can I can speak my truth because if I if I go through life not speaking my truth and something ugly happens, you know, and we and many of us can already see that we're heading down that road. It's just like you've been complicit, you've been sat there allowing it to allowing it to happen. So yes, I could go. Oh, you know, I only talk about regeneration, and that's really not my topic, but. To me, it's all part of the same pattern of, you know, dehumanization, the, you know, the disconnection with the soul of humanity. What we need is the regeneration of the soul of humanity, which means acknowledging that sex is important, that that polarity is one of the root um, aspects of life, you know, and also the freedom of expression. If we can't express ourselves, we, we become robots. Totally. And because there's no polarity yeah. of discourse, that which is just another yeah. aspect of polarity. And you need polarity. We want to minimize polarization, but we can't yeah. reduce polarity to unity because then there's no generative force to create life and create. Absolutely. Like, be, 
allow for for creative ideas to emerge. So yeah, I think we can leave it there. I think that that your your final statement was pretty uh, I drove it home. <laughs> so amazing yeah. to to meet again, and I think that will be very interesting for people to actually hear two human beings expressing these mm-hmm. things uh, unapologetically and yet with uh, I hope sensitivity and respect. And yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> yes. so lovely chatting to you, Adam. It's um it's always a joy. So <laughs> excellent. See you again. See ya.